Thank you so much for tuning in to She's All Over the Place with Kiriaki. That's me. Welcome back to She's All Over the Place. I am so excited. I have a fellow thespian with me today. Also, Eric Jensen is an actor, producer, screenwriter, and he appeared regularly in both seasons of the ABC series For Life. Other TV credits include major arcs on The Walking Dead, Mindhunter, and Mr. Robot. Appearances on The Americans, House of Cards, Elementary, The Blacklist, and many, many more, including his critically acclaimed portrayal of legendary New York Yankee Thurman Munson in The Bronx is Burning. Film credits include the upcoming Viral with Blair Underwood and Elfrey Woodward, Black Knight, the Love Letter, and more than two dozen indie films. His theater credits include, as an actor, the collaboration on Broadway opposite Paul Bettany and Jeremy Pope, the Pulitzer Prize winning production of Disgrace at the Lincoln Center. This list goes on and on and on, and so make sure you tune into the show notes so you can see other projects Eric has been working on. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. How are you? Thank you so much, Katie. I am I am all over the place with you. It sounds like it sounds like we're cut from the same cloth. Love that. Love that. <laughs> so I want to dive right into the collaboration, but I'm looking at the playbill actually right now. But first, where are you from? And when did you get the intuitive hit, the bug that you are an actor, performer, writer, director? Like, let's start there. Okay, great. Uh, well, I'm from a tiny, tiny town in northern Minnesota, uh, northwestern Minnesota, called Detroit Lakes. It's about 45 miles east of Fargo, North Dakota. It is. It's somewhere for me, but for other people, it would probably be considered the middle of nowhere. And um, actually, my interest in acting started there. Um, I was always a big reader, and I'd always read a lot of comic books and books and stuff like that. And when my family moved into the community to be close to my grandmother, uh, we joined a, a theater company called Playhouse 412 the local community theater. And so I, as a kid, I was doing things like The Music Man and Camelot and, you know, uh, shows like that, you know, sort of the standard uh, the standard musicals that every community theater in the country does. And it was a lot of fun. And I did it with my parents and uh, hung around adults a lot and felt very grown up and really dug being on stage as an 11 year old. Wow, that's so yeah. cool. And, and then, you had the support from your family. That's so nice. I did. I did. My, I definitely come from a really broken home. But um, this two-year period where we all were doing community theater together was pretty idyllic. And I discovered that no matter... Then I ended up moving around a lot because my parents got divorced. But I found out wherever I moved, there was always some kind of a theater community there, either at a high school or, or with a community theater. And I moved, I don't know, eight or nine times after that. And um, ended up at a high school called Apple Valley uh, High in uh, outside of Minneapolis, a uh, suburb. And uh, there's this uh, theater teacher named Dennis Swanson, who was my high school theater teacher. And uh, the first show that I was in, I had some behavioral issues, so I didn't make the second show. But um, Denny took me under his wing and, and really tried to teach me how to be a better person and a better human being, because that's not the kind of training I was getting at home. And uh, and he really took me under his wing and really introduced me to the rest of my life. He saved my life. Uh, I, I miss Denny very, very much. Um, we were doing all sorts of weird plays. We we're doing things by Eugenia Nesco and Samuel Beckett and and uh, Tom Stoppard. And, and he just he built a wonderful theater community for all of us kids to be a part of. A bunch of us ended up going to Juilliard, Carnegie Mellon, NYU. Uh, a bunch of us ended up graduating high school and getting into some pretty prestigious theater schools. So I'm proud of that. Wow. Congratulations. That's so Thank neat. You. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And, you know, something you said that's really important is community and how you wherever you were, you got into community theater, you found communities. And I feel, you know, as actors, a lot of times I know I feel alone and broken in many ways. And it's very competitive. So it's difficult to find, you know, people who are actually your friends who are supporting you. So doing it through like community theater and the ways you do, I feel like for a young entrepreneur who's tuning in, it's really important for them to get involved in their local communities. Yeah, it is. And the other way that I sort of 
kept to that uh, that rule or that idea or that notion. Big part of your community is an act of love. Uh, uh, it requires some sacrifice. Um, but the way that we continued to do it, I came to New York and um, had had a healthy acting career for about 10 years and then met my girlfriend, now wife, Jessica Blank. And uh, we ended up going out into different communities and interviewing people and making documentary theater out of their stories. It's another way for, uh, you know, sort of marginalized communities to get their voices heard. It's one way anyway. And we ended up writing a play called The Exonerated, which is which is pretty well known. And and, um, and then uh, another, uh, that was based on interviews with exonerated death row inmates. And then we uh, wrote a play called Aftermath based on our interviews with Iraqi refugees that we interviewed in Jordan. Then we took a couple of years off to make a play about rock and roll. And then uh, our most recent play was a play called Coal Country that the two-time Grammy Award winning musician Steve Earle uh, wrote the music for. And it was about a community in West Virginia where 29 coal miners were killed in a horrific and what I believe to be a, an avoidable explosion. And and, uh, you know, for all sorts of reasons, reasons of greed and uh, a lack of safety and all sorts of other things that should have been in place to protect these men. And uh, we interviewed survivors of the explosion and family members. And um, and then Steve wrote the music for it. It was a play with music. Wow. And it's it's one of the ways that I try to stay connected to the world in an unselfish way, because being an actor, you know this. I mean, it can be very self-involved. And you can be really into your shit and feeling the competition. And you really have to build a big ego field in order to handle all the rejection and competition. So it's nice to be a listener and to go into communities and listen to people's stories. Wow. I love everything you're saying. And I love how, you know, you met your partner and you're each other's accountability partners and you write together and then you see it through and then you go on with these interests. So it's really important of connecting with people in that authentic way by being mm -hmm. true to yourself and, you know, wanting to hear and be interested in other people's stories. Because as an actor, like the number one thing for us to do is observe. And right. so by uh, and doing all this research. So, I mean, you get to learn so much about humanity and history and rewrite and tell stories from your experience. Do you want to share how that is for you? Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, especially for younger people out there, part of the reason that we started making The Exonerated, for example, was because, well, my wife and I had just met and we were super, each individually very creative and we were looking for something to do together so we could hang out together all the time and do something more than just kissing. <laughs> um, and, um, and which was nice. I mean, I'm not knocking it, but, <laughs> you know, um, so anyway, um, you know, so one of the reasons we did it, though, was because uh, there was a, a commercial strike on uh, in the city. The unions were were on strike uh, because the commercial industry was really not so great at that time. Uh, it's still not great. But anyway, um, you know, we needed something to do over the course of this one summer. And um, we decided we'd go out and make our own stuff. And that's really key for any younger uh, people who, who are listening to this who might want to be performers or who are. I mean, obviously, anybody can get a camera now. It's not hard to make a, a short independent film. You know, my preference is, is that people do it through the union. But, you know, it's not hard for anybody who's creative to pick up a camera or any kind of medium or a, a recording device and make a podcast or make a dramatic podcast or a, a dramatic movie or a comedy uh, or even animation. I mean, all the tools are available to us now that weren't available when I was starting out. And um, it's such a rich world filled with all these valuable tools. And if people can make their own stuff, you're going to have people come to you a lot quicker. It, it beats like having your hands out and begging for a gig. You know what I mean? If you can give yourself that gift, yeah. it's really important. Yeah. Yeah. And it's this energy and rapport that you build and this confidence of knowing within. So then when you meet other people in the industry, you're not desperate just waiting for a job or waiting for an opportunity. You show you're a team player and you build other skill sets within the industry, which is a massive part of our industry. It's not just one sided. So yeah, yeah, I yeah think exactly. That's really beautiful. Exactly. Well, I've been, you know, I've always been a hyphenate. I've always been a actor, writer, director. Uh, I'm not, I'm not as good a producer as my wife. She's the producer in the family. But you know, I've always either wanted to tell stories or help people tell stories or or have people interpret stories that I've written down. And I've been fortunate to be able to play in all those fields. And when what when one is a little bit scant and there's not a lot of work say, you know, in voiceover land or whatever, um, I pick it up by doing a lot of TV. And when the TV isn't happening, I end up doing a play 
uh, just like the one I did with Paul Bettany and Jeremy Pope. I got very lucky uh, to do that. Um, it's been a quite a year because I had a, a health scare in uh, last February. I almost died. Oh, and uh, and oh, it's okay. Uh, I'm here. Wow. Yeah, it was really intense. I had a, a, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which some people call a brain aneurysm. And, um, you know, it, it was really devastating. Uh, I didn't have any um, behavioral or cognitive or physical ailments afterwards, which is super rare. Um, 80% of people that survive it uh, usually have some kind of cognitive or, or physical struggle that they have to go into therapy for. I didn't have any of that. Uh, if anything, it, it cleared my head. Um, and uh, we ended up going to, uh, to see Amelia Clark uh, from Game of Thrones. We ended up going to see her in a, a play of The Seagull in London. And she's had two brain aneurysms. And so this this is how this led directly to me doing the collaboration. I saw her do these amazing performances on stage in the Seagull uh, across from my friend Indira, who was also in the play. Indira hooked Amelia and I up. And after talking to her, um, I decided, well, you know, if she can do it, I can do it. And that's that's how I, I managed to make my Broadway debut. The collaboration came across my desk about two months after I asked my agents to start putting me back up for theater again. Wow. What yeah. a beautiful story. Yeah. Wow. So let's just dive into your character okay for the collaboration super cool uh the collaboration uh was a uh is a uh play by anthony mccartan directed directed by kwame kwe arma starring krista rodriguez jeremy pope and paul bettany and i was fortunate to be in it as well and i played uh the plays about andy warhol and jean michel basquiat and their uh collaboration their famous collaboration that they had together where they worked on paintings together uh it takes place in the mid 80s and i play bruno bischoff berger who was a representative uh a gallerist uh an art dealer and a representative representative for both artists. He had the idea to, to put them together when, this is the story that I heard, when uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat was in Switzerland with him and his family, um, Basquiat would get on the floor and, and draw with Bischoff Berger's kids. And he loved the interplay between them. And um, he loved uh, how generous of spirit that was. And he wondered if maybe Warhol and Basquiat uh, wouldn't be a good match in that department. And it took some doing. It took some convincing. Um, but I think both men were at a point in their career where they really needed each other. And they kind of fell in love as artists and as friends and uh, had the kind of collaboration that I'm fortunate enough to have with my wife. So I related to it very, very, mm. very much. <laughs> And uh, Bischoff, yeah. Berger, Bischoff Berger had a Swiss accent and it was a great fun character to play. I was on, I was off, I was on, I was off. And it was a, it was a, just, just the right size thing for me to make my debut in. Okay. And so is it possible to tune in since it's pretty fresh and, and do some of the accent right now on the show? <laughs> well, Bruno Bischoff Berger is a, the, the Swiss accent is very difficult because it's a little bit French and it's a little bit German. A lot of people say, oh, you're German, but then you see, you can't hear the R. You know, the R is, is very hard in German and it's not very uh, hard in, uh, in Swiss, Switzerland. So. Yeah, so that's that's the approximation. I've had Europeans tell me that it's pretty it's pretty pretty spot on. So wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I was <laughs> blown away, and it, the the language, the sound, you know, it it makes a part of the story of the whole experience. You know, just like the prolific moment of Basquiat and Warhol getting together, you with the sound and the language is matches just that experience too that's just like blows the audience away so congratulations that's so neat well yeah. it's fun oh it's my fun. god it's fun to be a guy who does exposition uh well i'm I, I feel like i've become a pretty good storyteller over the years after a lot of practice and um you know being the expositional voice in the piece and um describing to warhol why basquiat wants to work with him and to basquiat why warhol wants to work with him it's basically like a game of volleyball you know the person who posts the ball and sets it up in the air for the other person to knock it over. That was kind of my job in the play. And it was a fun game to play, especially with those actors. I mean, Paul Bettany and I had become quite good friends. We, um, we played guitars together before every uh, performance uh, each night in the theater, just to warm our voices up together. And nothing connects two uh, people like making music together, you know? So, uh, so yeah, Paul and I became pretty good friends, which I'm pretty happy about. You know, it's wow. rare. It's rare to r run across somebody who's so famous that has retained their ability to stay open and 
and loving. It's really easy. I've had a lot of friends become really famous and it's really easy to um, uh, take issue with what the world wants from you, you know, and if you surround yourself with good people, good hearted people um, and have a we're all in this together kind of attitude, I think you end up uh, just like Paul Bettany. Yeah. And um, I, I want, there's so many points I want to dive into, but first and foremost, I want to say um, what you mentioned, good people, because I, that is my mission mm -hmm. to only be around good people because I have been around around so many bad people and like not knowing it in the industry and then thinking that yeah. was the industry norm and being caught up. I was very particular, you know, of which circles I got caught up with, but still, I mean, people are very clever and they're out for themselves and there are a lot of bad people out there. So that's why when you were saying community theater and, you know, reading a lot and why I applauded, you know, get involved with the community, like theater, while it's so important. What are some like red fl flags and green flags mm -hmm. for people tuning in um, with your experience in the industry of knowing who's good and what to stay away from? Well, you know, that nobody has ever asked me that question before. And that's a super interesting question. Um, the 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 red flags and the green flags tend to be opposite sides of the coin uh, for me. Uh, a red flag would be somebody who solely talks about themselves. A red flag would be somebody who talks when people leave the room, who talks about other people in a derisive or, you know, you got to listen to how people talk about people who leave the room, because when you leave the room, they're going to be talking about you. And, um, you know, uh, there's a, I'm a Buddhist and there's a Buddhist prohibition against gossip for a reason. I think gossip can be very damaging to people, not only the people who are the subject of the gossip, but also to the people who are engaging in it. Uh, other red flags for me are um, uh, people who direct other actors. Uh, you know, actors got to respect actors unless you're doing devised work and you're in a very tight community where you can talk with each other that openly. I think actors who tell other actors what to do instead of letting them explore themselves are kind of a red flag. Yelling abusive behavior. Um, if this happens with another person in the cast, I'm grown up enough now to know that I have the right to uh, to say something and to stop it. And I think the industry has changed quite a bit in that department. You know, the sort of toxic cis white male uh, hierarchy of the theater and the film industry is uh, gra uh, gratefully uh, being, being broken up. And that kind of behavior just doesn't fly anymore because it's on Twitter the next day. You know, so those are red flags for me. Um, uh, somebody who's not gracious, somebody who treats the crew badly. Those are also red flags for me. Uh, and when those red flags pop up, I don't just, I nest, sometimes I walk away, but some, that, at that point I would just not get involved if all those things popped up on one person. But sometimes you find yourself in the middle of a project where you still got to maintain your, your composure and your professionalism and those red flags pop up and, then it's just best to avoid those people as much as possible and, and stand up against them when necessary. Um, green flags for me are good listeners, uh, gen a general op openness to everybody's contribution. Everybody's got a contribution to make. Yes, everybody must stay in their lane, but sometimes if you're a smart director, you're hearing something from the, the guy who paints the set about, oh, you know, this guy could come over and do this. And if you pick up on that and utilize that, it's like, you know, 20 brains in the room. Why is yours the best? It's not. There's like 20 other people with different ideas. As the director, it's just up to you to filter through all those and figure out which ones fit the story best. I also think um, people who are kind to animals, that's a good green flag. <laughs> You know, people, I think people who have managed to, uh, to uh, have this career and, and uh, uh, go through undamaged uh, and have a family and stuff like that. I think those are, are great people to be involved with. You know, I take my daughter on set and to the theater and to rehearsal all the time. And, and uh, you know, that kind of uh, openness, people being open to stuff like that, that means a lot to me too. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well said. I, I love those red flags. Mm -hmm. And I love the green flags. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, she's mm -hmm. so lucky. That's so cool. That it's pretty cool. Has those experiences. Well, we're getting ready to this summer. Um, we got inspired uh, by my friend Brooke uh, Berman, who just uh, uh, got her uh, um, under micro budget film uh, funded. Uh, on her own, she went out and, and did it. And we were like, you know, we directed a $1 million feature oh, about 
five years ago called Almost Home, uh, based on my wife's book about uh, about uh, homeless teens in Los Angeles, uh, a, sort of a tribe of them. And it was it was a pretty good movie. Uh, I still see some flaws in it, but you know it was time for us to direct another movie again. And after Brooke inspired us by going out and doing it on her own, we decided we we're going to do another micro budget film. And this time around, because Sadie wants to join the family business, we decided that I would play the dad in the movie and she would play the daughter. And uh, it's a coming home story of a guy going back to Minnesota. His family's very different from what he's used to in Brooklyn. It's semi autobiographical, but not 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 totally. And then uh, and then Sadie plays my daughter, and it's really a coming of age movie about about her and what it's like to be thirteen and what it's like to try to bring people together when they don't want to get together. You know, when you're that age, it's a unique age. Yeah. And then, are you directing it? Ah, uh, yes. My wife and I are co-directing. Uh, we're going to split our directing duties a little differently this time. Um, mostly, I have uh, storyboarding. I used to be a cartoonist. I was a cartoonist for High Times Magazine, like many years ago when I moved to New York, and uh, and for like hemp clothing companies, I did all these cartoons and things that were really fun and weird. And so I'm very visual as a, and so I spend a lot of time talking to the DP. So I'll do all the storyboards uh, in consult in consultation with Jess and the DP. Jess will direct most of the other acts actors and uh, me and my daughter, we have a really good rapport as director and actor because I put her on tape for all of her auditions. So I'll be directing her mostly and keeping us in this safe little bubble in the car while Jess takes care of the other stuff. So that's how we're going to split up co-directing this time. Usually it works where I'm behind the monitor and she's up there with the actors getting into it with them. And um, that's great. But this is the first thing that we've written that I've actually written a big part for myself into act in. So um, so that's it's that that makes this project different and it makes the it makes my duties as a director slightly different. Yeah, we'll have to have her on in the near future when it wraps and everything talking about her experience as a preteen. Totally. <laughs> oh, she, yeah. loved it. she would totally love you. Yeah, yeah. she's she's she's. Uh, she's uh, she likes she likes uh, unique and driven people, and uh, I'm, I'm sure you would land high on her list. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're yeah, welcome. and she would be the first, um, you know, teen actor on the show too. <laughs> that would be great. I'm sure she'd love it. I'm sure yeah, she'd love it. Yeah. She's a really good there, kid. You know. Yeah. She's yeah, th- 13, going cool. on 27. She's she's something else. Yeah, I have a niece. Her name is Lana. That's her name right there. L A N A because she's my heart and soul. Aww. But she just she just turned fifteen in November. So but she's oh, you're like the, the mini me. And you're the cool aunt? Yeah, I'm the cool yeah. I'm the cool aunt. So <laughs> that's so uh, cool. <laughs> and she does anime. She's really into anime. Really? So does she do a lot of cartooning or does she do animation? Like like making her own yeah, stuff? Or- she- Wow. Yeah. I, I'll show I'll show you sometime. I mean, she's brilliant. She's been doing it since she was ten years old. I mean, she's been drawing, but I mean, these these look amazing. Like a twenty seven year old or like you would see on the TV. And she's wow. very good. And then my mom and dad got her the um electronics a few years ago. So she's, you know, di- does digital stuff, but she likes to do it by hand, which I do too as an artist. I like doodling and 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 touching the paint and you know ha- having the pencil or the pen in my in my hand you know I'm yeah I'm, I don't know about you but I'm an empath I'm an HSP highly sensitive person you know and I think as an actor and as an artist it's great to have that quality of being very sensitive in that way so um I'm interesting when it when I do electronic in that way you know but with yeah, the guitar you like riffing yeah. you know you feel it yeah, well, it's I feel the same way. Um, I I've got my instruments in the back here. Um, yeah. My 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 really nice guitars are in the shop right now. Um, but these two are pretty good. But uh, yeah, no, I'm an analog guy. I love vinyl. Um, I love putting records on a record player, and then they stop, and then I turn them over rather than have music having music on shuffle all day long. I like um, the feel of records when I pick them up in a record store. I like looking at the cover. You know, I'm very much an analog guy, and and uh, I I don't know if I qualify as a highly sensitive person. I probably do. Uh, my, my feelings are uh, uh, less easily hurt since I had my aneurysm, but it's it's pretty easy oh. for me to get my feelings stomped on if somebody's particularly egregiously cruel. And uh, But, you know, again, we avoid those people. But uh, but yeah, no, analog, pen in, pen in hand, paintbrush in hand. You know, I like to do all of my storyboards analog. As much as I love the Apple pen or whatever it is, um, you know, it's uh, it's easier to store storyboards that way. But I do mine. I do mine analog and then uh, and then digitize them after. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
So going in even more, which year did you go to New York City? Oh, that's a great, it was a great time to move to New York City. It was an exciting time to be in New York. Um, I moved to New York in, uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon starting in 88. I moved to New York in 92. And um, and I lived uh, in South Williamsburg and get this, a 3,000 square foot loft. It was just me and a roommate with five floor to ceiling windows. Ceilings were like 20, 25 feet high. And uh, it was an old sewing machine factory, a big open loft space with a little workshop in the back and a main bedroom. And it was only $400 a month, if you can believe wow. it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. I, was, I was very lucky uh, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. have found that apartment. But then I left it fairly quickly being like, well, I'll find another place like this. And it hasn't been like that. <laughs> Yeah. Since then. Yeah. But the city was the city was pretty yeah. pretty rough like it is now. There was a lot of heroin everywhere. Um uh, a lot of temptation <laughs> in that realm. Uh, uh, yeah, it was like pretty serious. It was it was grunge time. It was you know Nirvana and Pearl Jam were a big thing, and the whole uh, West Coast was awash in heroin, and it just made its way east, and it devastated uh, a whole community. You know, it was like it was like another plague after the after yeah. the AIDS AIDS scare of the eighties. You know, so it was a it was a yeah. good time to be in New York, but it was a tough time too because a lot of people were hooked. And you say now being a tough time because of um, the pandemic. Or are, is there heroin back on the scene and I don't know about it? Uh, heroin is not back in the scene now, as far as I know. I mean, I'm sober, so um, so I don't pay that much attention. But though, but because of the pandemic, I think the certainly the the rate of uh, unhomed people is extremely high, and um, it's a lot more intense than it used to be. I just spent some time in Los Angeles. It's more intense there because the winter the winters here tend to force people inside or force them to find different situations or force them onto the subway. Um, and the homelessness uh, in terms of intensity is much higher um, out in LA because the because of the weather you can you can survive you know talk about being an empath I mean that every time I get on the subway it hurts my heart because I see so many examples of mental illness and I see so much work that needs to be done in helping people and I'm just a storyteller I'm, I'm not able to help everybody all the time so it's so it's uh, it's hard it's hard to explain to my daughter you know yeah. why our society sort of throws away people like that and ignores them and and uh, tries to pretend they're not there, you know? So one of those things, you know? So yeah, yeah so 90s well, New York. Cause we're taught, we're taught like to turn a blind eye, mind your own business, stay in your own lane. So mm -hmm. these unhealthy tools were taught instead of helping a neighbor, helping like people are scared, right? Especially uh -huh. in the city. So I think people were all good. I just think we have these bad habits that we were taught, you know, in society, so. Right. Yeah. I think, I think there's, we have a problem. We have an addiction to avoidance right now as a, as a culture, really on both sides of the, of the uh, political divide. Uh, if there are two sides, I think there's probably more sides than that in actuality, but the, the two strongest sides uh, have an uh, addiction to avoidance. You know, nobody's really dealing with the problems that are really afflicting us right now. We need, we need people with heart in the right places to help us do that. Agreed. 1000% agreed. Okay. So Honing in just a little bit more, when you first came to New York City, did you have a camera then? No, I didn't. I had, what I did have was I started a theater company. Um, oh, you started was, a theater company. Yeah, That's it so was cool. Called, it was called Rogue Repertory. And we did uh, we did Commedia dell'art plays and we did uh, some Shakespeare. We did Comedy of Errors and a couple other plays by a guy named Mari Vo. And really had a good couple of years with that, good couple of years of running with that theater company. It was mostly, most of us were uh, actors who were on soap operas. We would do soap operas, our soap opera job during the day and then rehearse at night. And uh, and we ended up uh, we ended up garnering some really good reviews from The Voice and from The Times and from, I think from The Times. Uh, from, you know, we ended up building a professional theater company fairly quickly and we, we funded it mostly with uh, soap opera auctions. The soap opera conventions were a big thing then and so we would you know give away autograph scripts autographed by the entire cast and they would make a donation a not-for-profit donation to the theater company and and uh it was it was pretty pretty high times for us uh this wonderful friend of mine uh nathan fillion who's now uh who was on um oh he was on a show a science fiction show that everybody loves called firefly um he's on a show now called the rookie 
just a really great guy. He he kind of got involved with us and did some readings with us, and and uh, and then we all went our separate ways and our own individual ways. We've all continued creating. Some people have become artistic directors. Some people have continued to act. Um, some people uh, went off to make movies. My friend Dave went off and started a commercial theater company that produced my first play as a writer. So um, yeah, we're all still friends, believe it or not. And circling back around to community and theater, it's that's where you get to nourish and befriend these people who it's like an oak tree. And then they go off, like you just mentioned, they go off and they do various things. And you sowed such good seeds and nourish these beautiful relationships that you hear about something, you call them up, they hear about you, they call you up. And then, and then you get to grow together. That's being like very rooted in a healthy way. Um, That's really, really beautiful to hear you and for me to hear how it's blossomed for you and other people in your communities through the theater. Another red flag for me is jealousy. If I can feel jealousy coming off of somebody, I, I try to I try to either uh, help them rid themselves of that idea or I tend to avoid them because uh, there is no time for jealousy in this industry. You can find there's all sorts of good people here. There's there's allies everywhere. And the people who who are impressed with your work are the people that you want to work with. The people who are who are jealous of you, uh, you know, have some other stuff that they're working through, and they need to work through that uh, without without you. Generally, you know, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a tough one because I have a lot of empathy and compassion about that. I felt jealous at times myself, but I found it's much easier to support my friends who are doing well, who in turn uh, will often give a hand to me when I'm, when I'm in need of a job or in need of uh, some support. Um, you know, it's just, it, what comes around goes around. Yeah. I love yeah. that. And I've always had a positive mental attitude, short-term, medium-term, long-term goals growing up as a cross-country runner. And I've always been in service and helping people and, you know, just like complimenting people and just like being in service. It's one of my love languages and it makes me feel so good. However, I feel it's just been really one-sided a lot and Mm -hmm. I felt a lot of jealousy. And even now, like there's just so many people. And so it's just like really getting still and being aware and, you know, utilizing certain tools just to like, it's better to be like alone and like have one or two people than to be around bad people or or jealous people who aren't rooting for you. Right. You You never want to be, you never want to be uncomfortable in the space that you create. Like in the spaces of life that you create, you know, if you find yourself apologizing for yourself for being terribly uncomfortable in that space, something needs to be addressed. And it's either, either within or it's somebody who's influencing you. I've found as I've gotten older, um, that, uh, negative energy has less of an influence on me, especially since I almost died. You know, I've got a whole new outlook on life and I've got a whole new outlook, like, uh, especially for young people. I wish, you know, I'm one of those guys who wishes he could do his twenties over again. I made so many mistakes and missed so many opportunities because of, because of my own fear. And, you know, after almost dying, um, and having it being a very, um, very beautiful and mellow process uh, as, as even as we were figuring out whether or not I was going to survive or not, or whether or not I'd respond to surgery. I just felt this unending love for my wife, my daughter, and for all the friends who were coming to visit me. And I decided it was better to live in that than to live with all the other stuff. And, and uh, yeah, like I said, you know, in in a lot of ways, my uh, temporary sickness, I have no, there's no chance of me having a relapse or anything as long as I take my blood thinners. But, you know, having that illness descend on me really from out of nowhere, uh, due to no fault of my own, um, really, uh, really woke me up to the beauty that's around me. So in a lot of ways, it was real, it was a real blessing in disguise. And yeah, especially because m- my theory is no matter if it's good or bad, it's all energy. And so you can mm-hmm. take all of those experiences and apply it to your craft. So it's going to make you a better actor. It's going to, when people, millions of people are watching you, you know, people, they know, they feel it. And so when you're saying your lines and making your choices, you know, they're going to be connected with you on that, you know, sensorial energetic level level. And they won't know what you went through unless they study it of what you went through, but it's just going to make you that much more powerful. And so maybe that's a part of your purpose because of the path that you're on as a, you know, as a storyteller and creator, you know, as an actor as well. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, I, I think um, there, the actors that I love the most are the actors who have, who have overcome difficult, great things 
who have overcome great things and, um, you know, and have done so with uh, style and class. I mean, I don't think anybody in the world can do it with as much class as Paul Newman, who was my favorite actor when I was growing up. But, you know, there are a lot of people out there who, um, who take their approach with, with an amount of style and grace and uh, loving kindness that I really appreciate. And I, uh, I, uh, I look up to them. Uh, it's important to have role models too. That's a good, that's a good thing for, for all of us to have or role models of how we want to be when we enter the next phase of our career, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've always had mentors since I was young. I think being a cross country runner, I just had like coaches. Mm -hmm. So I always, you know, and as a kid, I was reading a lot of Socrates and Plato, like Greek mythology. So I was in these, you know, fantasy worlds, but always seeking mentors, people to look up to, yearning to just to be a sponge to to grow and learn. I was super so, into Greek mythology. I, I there were the there were a couple of drawing books, uh, Dolaire, Dolaire's mythology. They were they were uh, Greek and Norse mythology books with these beautiful drawings in them by this couple, and um, I, I really responded to those. But Greek Greek mythology was a big deal for me when I was coming up as a kid. I didn't know how many lessons there were contained within those within those pages, but there are a lot. Oh yeah, and uh, viscerally as well. You know, yeah. like sometimes it just goes into your psyche and sometimes it's words and language that you can't even pronounce but it's a feeling and it's a knowing and and you like you have this intuitive hit of what you remembered and it shape shift you know our our lives yeah totally um, Hades town i mean come on like Hadestown was so <laughs> brilliant wow do you go see yeah. a lot of theater I do. I'm, do. I love theater. I, I, I love theater. I actually have a short story. I uh, studied Shakespeare in London um, oh. on a summer program, and I saw 45 uh, Broadway productions in five weeks. Oh, my and, God. Uh-huh. Some I went to two a day. And so it was called lastminute.com. And you could um, get your ticket there. And I got it for 10 pounds because I would go solo. And then the students would... You'd put in the Facebook group if you want to join. Oh, I got a ticket to here, but I would get a solo ticket. And because I got a solo ticket, I would get bleacher nosebleed seats. But every time I went 44 times out of 45, I got upgraded to like, I saw Lay Miz seventh row center. Like so many. <laughs> That's so, awesome. <laughs> yeah. The two ladies next to me, that was like their eighth time ever seeing it. It was my first. But it was a great production. I actually saw the seagull there too. Um, oh, right when, on! When I was in, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. When I was in London, I saw it. So that was wow. That was pretty what cool. what a play! I mean, what a beautiful. I'm a big Chekhov nut. Um, I've uh, I really thrive on on Samuel Beckett and and uh, Chekhov. Um, Shakespeare, I love seeing it, and I really appreciate people who can do it. But I've never quite been able to crack the nut myself except mm. maybe in the comedies a little bit but um the mm -hmm. uh the closest i've gotten i think was when i when i did this i did this one man play that my wife and i wrote about lester bangs the music critic and uh that was uh based on the writings of a real writer who was a, a big music the biggest music critic ever um uh rolling stone cream magazine i mean he was just a he was a, he would always insert himself into the stories of the people he was writing about sometimes to their great annoyance but that's the wrestling with his language is as close as I've gotten to doing Shakespeare. And, uh, and maybe someday, you know, I got a lot of friends at the public theater, so maybe there's still time, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I went to the globe a couple times. Saw Did some you? Shakespeare. Yeah. Cause, uh, it was a part, we went with the, the, the program. So I went to oh, the sure. globe a couple times. We went, um, on a weekend trip to Stratford upon Avon huh. where he was birthed. Then we went to Anne Hathaway's cottage and, wow. um, and then there was, we saw a production of Shakespeare while we were there. And I went to where he's buried, you know, on the land. So you and your family, you would love it. It's so great. There's water, you walk around. It's really beautiful. Although like, you know, you're at a church where they're all buried next to each other, but you know, it's, it's all Shakespeare town and it's, oh, wow. it's just, it's very romantic, actually. I was oh. there with the program, but <laughs> but it's it's very, very beautiful and romantic. And on your way back um, to London, there's this famous castle, so you can go there and have the experience. But yeah, uh, Stratford-upon-Avon, great history there. I went to Shakespeare's home of where he was born, and, oh, and wow. his father was a shoemaker. His father 
was the mayor of the town. And that's why he had the fine education. And that's how he became Shakespeare and had the luxuries of going to London and doing all the things he was able to do because his dad was the mayor and a shoemaker. And so I was in their home and you would see just in, in part of their home of the door that would open up where they would sell these leather goods. Oh, um, wow. And yeah, and the, the the beds and everything. I mean, they were very small, but you, you see the the whole house of, of how they live. So it's it's wonderful to see, especially if you're into theater. I, 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 I there's a my wife and I have plans right now. We're involved with uh, with Kwame Kwearma, who uh, is the head of the Young Vic in London, and uh, we're going to make something for him. We're not quite sure what it is yet. Probably a documentary play. We're not. We're just not sure. But anyway, uh, we hope to spend some time producing that in London. I've worked in. London, I've had two plays of ours in London. And I, I love working there so much. I love being there. And the fact that it's a short ride to Paris now from London is just, it means the world to me. So those two cities, I want to spend a copious amount of time in. Um, I just got to have one of our TV or movie things just get off the ground here because I, I can't I can't let these projects go. I got these five projects on the back burner that are cooking. And, uh, and as soon as the last one of those is done, maybe it's time to spend some time in Paris or London for a year. So yeah, I love being yeah. an expat. Yeah. Oh, and then and lastly, about this subject, it kind of all ties in. It's wild because when we were at Stratford upon Avon and we were at the theater there, we saw Hamlet. Oh, um, yeah, I saw Hamlet there. And guess what? You're never going to guess, so I'm just going to tell you. Okay. Um, the <laughs> the um the wardrobe designer, the theme was Basquiat, so the whole entire cast was wearing Basquiat clothing. And oh, so wow. I'm, yeah, and I'm like, I'm an art head, so. It was so cool, like being in a fashion and art and, and watching Hamlet and then, <laughs> and then seeing everyone dressed in like Bosquiet gear. It was so cool. How did you not jump out of your seat? That sounds like a thrilling time. That just sounds like oh. a completely thrilling piece. I could tell. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll put you on the Instagram, actually. One of the actors um, I connected with and we still follow each other on Instagram. So maybe you already know him, but I'll, I'll send you his link so you can you can see who I'm talking about. But he's a he's a theater actor. In, oh, excellent. In yeah, mm -hmm. I love I yeah. love making connections uh, uh, through any variety of, of ways. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So circling into the collaboration um, on like more of a technical process aspect of you informed your agent, I want to go out for theater. You had an opportunity for your debut production with the collaboration. How was the process of auditioning? Like when just like tell me the start of you made the call, you knew the project, they called you, like, what's the process? You get the call as an actor, here's the opportunity, everything else goes to the side, here we are. Right, I, I got an email and um, saying that this audition was available, and 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 usually it's it's the emails that I get these days are say ch say checking for interest because they don't want me auditioning for anything that I'm not interested in. So I got the email say you know checking for interest, and I saw immediately what it was. Um, I had met a Swiss guy in uh, during our vacation to London, and I already had, so and I talked to him for a long time, and I had his accent uh, in my lockbox in the back of my head, so I kind of knew exactly how I wanted the character to sound. And then I started to look for footage of of the real Bruno Bischoff Berger, and there wasn't a lot out there, but there was a a, a thing called on. Uh, I want to say it was on HBO, but I could be wrong. It was called the Andy Warhol Diaries. It might have been on Netflix, uh, and it was uh, basically, you know, he narrated a diary every every uh, every morning uh, with his secretary. He would narrate what he did the night before and and how his day was and what he spent time creating and stuff like that. And so it's a very first person, real narrative of what he did uh, day in and day out. And Bischoff Berger was was interviewed for the documentary piece based on Andy Warhol's diaries, and he's still around. He's still in Switzerland. He's still like, you know, going strong. So that was pretty cool. And then I found these other interviews from um, some Basquiat documentaries with Bischoff Berger and I got his rhythm. I decided, this is before the audition still, I decided that he was somebody who loved his artists the same way that my best agent that I ever had loved me. And um, when you love an artist, you have to put up with a lot of shit. <laughs> And, um, and, and you put up with, and you're so at different times when you're an agent for somebody or you represent them, you know, you have to, they have moments of doubt. And so you're there to, to be kind of a parent to them 
or a sibling um, or uh, just a just a, a sounding board for their frustrations. And when they're inspired, you know, sometimes people who get inspired really need to need help getting focused. And so a good representative can help you do that. And I just decided that the best way to approach the play was to really be a guy who looks out for his artists. And I think that opened me up to better listening. And so and for the first time in a long time, I decided to do the audition on Zoom instead of pre-recording it, um, having somebody to record me on camera. Um, so I just did the audition live with casting. Like how many people were on the other side of the Zoom that you could see? Uh, two people in different rooms. Okay. And so they were just putting me on tape for Kwame, the director. And I guess they were going to show the top five or 10 tapes to Kwame and decide, you know, who should be the guy to play Bruno. But the fun thing about being on Zoom was I had that almost a live experience of communicating with somebody over, you know, and it was like kind of where do I put my eyes? And I, I just put my eyes on the person on the other side of the screen, just like I'm doing with you now. And um, and it was very fruitful and felt really good. And and I made a little mistake at the end. I lost track of my lines and I kind of shuffled the pages and looked for the line. And I just finished it up with a small improv to tie things up. And I said, do you want me to do that again? Because I kind of fucked up the last, you know, the last little bit. And both he and his assistant were like, no, no, no. <laughs> I was like, you sure? And they're like, it was great. Trust us. And I was like, all right. And I did, and I didn't push. And um, and uh, before I knew it, I had the part. Wow. And like, before you knew it. So how, how soon after? Like days, weeks? Like, how was it? It was about a week or so, a little less than a week. I wasn't too, you know, I'd been at Manhattan Theater Club before. Uh, I started one play. And then my very first play that I did in New York, I was an understudy for four different parts. And I ended up going on for all of those people and with wonderful, just wonderful actors. Uh, Michael, um, oh, the guy from Dexter, uh, Michael, uh, I can't Shannon? remember. Uh, no, 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 sorry. My, that's a, sorry. That's a different one. Yeah. That's a different one, but it's, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm forgetting Michael's last name. He's, he's, he's the lead in Dexter and he's just a wonderful, lovely guy and a wonderful actor. And, and, um, you know, I, uh, I was understudying for him and then a few other people, I didn't have to go on for him. Thank God that would have been tough shoes to fill, but I went on for the other guys and, and, uh, uh equally tough shoes to fill, but I felt a little more up to the challenge. And then uh, I ended up doing a play called Y2K for them with my mentor, Arthur Copet. And so this was being on Broadway with Manhattan Theater Club was a full circle thing for me. Uh, it went from the beginning of my career to now. Um, so uh, I was very appreciative to have that opportunity as well. Yeah, wonderful. And so in the craft part of it, of mm -hmm. you know, watching the diaries, listening to his voice, having the person that you met, then did you study with the dialect coach? Did you develop it yourself? Did you call a bunch of Swiss companies and just talk to them on the phone. <laughs> That's the way I should have done it. Um, no, I, 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 uh, I did my rough approximation of the accent and then a, a, a woman named uh, Deb Hecht, I believe. Uh, she used to be a teacher at Juilliard. She was hired uh, to come in and help me work on my on my uh, Swiss and help uh, other actors work on their dialects if they if they needed any. And uh, and but mostly she worked with me and she really hammered home the noise, the sound changes with me. She was really she took a lot of notes early on. I was I could have easily have skated, but she wanted me up to the point she told me where if a swiss person came they would they would lean forward and have a hard time telling i wasn't swiss that's how um wonderfully demanding she was and and it was an act of love and uh and uh, and i'm very grateful that i got to work that hard to make the accent right wonderful yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, but i but i mean like technique wise, you know, it's you're just playing your objectives but you also have an accent. I mean, the accent sort of dresses it up a little bit. It makes it a little easier to be loose in a way because it makes it so much further from me. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm not really this person. So I can totally embarrass myself and say outrageous things. And, and it's clear that I'm not this person because I have the accent so I can get away with this. <laughs> Yeah, that's how I feel. Like, you know, when when I do certain things, it's like you put on this energetic layer of something else, right? You like like just step into something and it's an extension so you can make it a part of your character. So, right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and the thing about theater is it's, you know, you the next night it won't be the same. <laughs> oh, that's what I love the most about this. I mean, it doing we did I don't know, we did 80 some performances and um it was so great night tonight working with these great actors um, uh, uh, with Krista and Paul and Jeremy, because it was like being in a great jazz band. 
You know, like you all knew the tune, you all knew how it was going to go, but little moments would be different. Little things would be different. People would say, people would say the same words, but with slightly different take on them, slightly different movements. So it made you listen differently. And you're like, oh, you're going to give me that. Well, I'm going to give you this. And it became, uh, it, we, the text was so ingrained in all of us. It became a great deal of fun to continue the life of the play with new things and finding new things. And, you know, Paul and Jeremy had been doing it for a year. They did the play in London. Then they went off and did the movie, and then they came back to New York to do the play again. So they've been living, and it went so well that they extended it. Yeah, exactly. Twice. Yeah, it was super exciting. It was super exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Lucky me. I mean, I saw um, the the second to last performance, so I was like, yes, because this is when they're really going to give it their all. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah. We really did. I was glad. I was glad to meet you there afterwards. I could tell you were you were a special person just from the way you said hi and approached me, and I felt like I was approached by uh, somebody who definitely loved theater. And when somebody mentioned you had a podcast, or you mentioned you had a podcast, I was like. Well, I want to be on her podcast. You know, she's she really loves what we do, and and uh, that's uh, it's nice to meet a fellow traveler in that. My pleasure, one thousand percent. And actually, you're the first theater actor on the show. Really? Oh, well, mm- wow, that's kind of a thrill. Well, thank you. Yeah, Thanks for having definitely. Me. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, just um, just to geek out for a second, I have boxes of playbills and uh, I have so many signed, gratefully, and one by you, thankfully. Uh-huh. And I'm a painter, so I do collages. So I have these visions to put these playbills on a collage and then they're signed by the actors. Yeah, sure. Totally. Totally. So totally. I, I have one from... Philip Seymour Hoffman, Death of a Salesman. Oh, man, you saw that? I didn't get to see that. Oh, I'm so jealous that you got to see that. He was the best actor of my generation, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. Best actor, best actor of our generation. He was, he was, he was something else. Like, just now that I know what I'm doing... And whenever I watch something that he's in, uh, you know, whether it's um, the the Capote thing that he did, or whether it's um, uh, uh, Almost Famous, or whether it's um, whether it's uh, any any of the movies that he was in, uh, the one where he plays the guy playing basketball in that funny scene with uh, what was that called? I can't remember. Um, but anything that he's in, he I just see what his technique is. I see what he's doing. Um, it's invisible. It's art. Uh, and it's also artless. Uh, it's so many things at once. He's got a whole circus going on in his head, and it's just such a pleasure to watch him channel that energy. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I miss him a great deal. I got to, I got, yeah. to, I got to meet, I got to be in. I was in one movie with him, and I got to audition for him once, and that's my extent of contact that I had with him. But he was a really, really nice guy. Which film were you in with him? I was in a film with him and Stanley Tucci and Kira Sedgwick. It was called Montana. And it mm. was just one of those Sundance indie films that that uh, that made it to Sundance and got good reviews, but just never really made it out into the world in the way that it should have. So, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. No. Thanks for sharing. Oh, s- switching gears here, um, but honing in some more of like a, a technical aspect. I know theater audition is different than a TV and or a film audition, mm. but there's a lot of buzz right now with um, casting directors putting a lot of posts on social media, like you just need a good backdrop and good lighting. You don't need to pay someone. And there's this uh, lack of communication. So there's better communication. So the actors are feeling that thirst of knowledge and that love to, to hear some information instead of just listening to other uneducated actors. But when you auditioned on Zoom for the collaboration, mm-hmm. a couple of things. One, were you mic'd? Two, what was your backdrop? Three, what was your frame? Because you were doing mm. a live audition. So sure. just because people are wondering that probably when they're listening and th- just those little things can be setbacks. So I would just like to hit on those. Well, I'll start with lighting. I, uh, I, I don't know how much of this video may, will make it online, but I use my little ring light here. And I set, I set, I set my little ring light up. Um, to, and then I've got two overhead lights here that, uh, that, uh, I bounce off the wall. So I'm well lit. 
and the lighting separates me from my background. I didn't, I didn't um, blur out my background. I think that's very distracting. Um, I have a bunch of art on the walls, which I figured people could imagine fit for Bruno Bischoff Burger. And um, now stepping back one second, I do have a backdrop out in the other room where we film, where we tape most of our auditions. But since this was going to be on Zoom, I wanted to be seated and I wanted to give them a close up because uh, if I'd stepped too far back, on a tiny little computer, they're not going to be able to see my face really all that well in playback. So I, you want to make their job as easy as possible for them. And uh, I just, and I, and I made eye contact with the screen and um, I did not use a microphone. Um, I didn't wear earphones. I just uh, used the ambient sound in the room uh, to give it the most live sounding uh, qualities possible. I suppose if I did it again now, I'd, I'd probably use this microphone and the earphones that come straight out of the computer, but there's a chance that you can get feedback that way. So, so I'm not quite sure, but whatever I did, um, just using the normal camera and microphone off the computer, that's what got me the job. So if I do a Zoom audition, that's how I'm going to do it from now on. And, you know, give them the benefit of the close up. They'll see the feelings and emotions and things that pass across your face or pass through you and uh, give them an easy opportunity to see all that. And, and then, and then after that, it's really out of your control. You can't, you can't make somebody hire you, you know, like, yeah, I just had to, I just had to come in with my take on the character and the attitude that today, this is my opportunity to act today and I'm going to do it and I'm going to have fun doing it. And I'm not going to be like, I'm not going to act like I want to get a job. Obviously I want to get the job, but a lot of people come into the room acting like they want to get the job. And that's all that people get from them. And that's a big mistake. You really, really want to behave as the person you want to go in and play. And, and that's why they call it a play. Um, and you want to, you want to go in and do that. And, and then the job will come, you know, I believe anyway, um, or it won't. And which is, which is equally valid. That means it was somebody else's day and it's not yours, you know? Yeah. I'm so glad that I asked because I kind, I kind of assumed that you use the backdrop and, and then it, from your character choice, it's very artistic so it makes sense to use that. And that's cool because, you know, actors are told just like no distractions, but it suited the character. So it made right. sense. And then also, you know, I saw the play. So, you know, you were raising your hand, you were moving around a lot. So when I envisioned you doing the audition, I saw you stepping back from the camera and you using and your whole body. And so gesturing, right? Yeah. But you didn't, you sat down. So were you able to still like move your body side to side, like as if you were standing up um, to be just really like moving your body. Like, how was that? When I do any kind of camera work, um, I really respect the sort of Michael Caine school of acting where you really focus on stillness. Any movement when you're on camera, whether it's for a, whether it's for a film or a play or whatever, any movement that you do on camera, regardless of what it's for, has to be earned um, or justified by the language. Like, oh, I'm, I'm reaching for a glass of water and I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to, I'm going to drink it. You know, um, yeah. So I couldn't do as much physical bodily embodiment of the character as I would on stage, but I didn't need to, you know, because this captures so much, this little frame here. And, you know, uh, within, within this magical little box, you can see, you can see, uh, I believe you can see people, uh, fight. You can see people get vindictive about each other. You can see people fall in love, you know, and, you know, I, uh, I have a book to recommend to anybody out there who wants to learn the most about camera acting that they can buy from a book that isn't about acting. Um, it's a book called uh, In the Blink of an Eye. And it's uh, it's by a very uh, a very famous editor. He's one of the he's one of the uh, uh, his name is Walter Murch, and it's all about editing, and it's all about how film is an editor's medium, and your job really as an actor. This is what I garnered from the book anyway, is to provide raw material for the director and the editor to use in the editing room, mm. and you want to provide them as much raw material with as much range as the director will allow you. On, on set to give them a truthful performance that they can then edit together um, from a variety of sources. And oftentimes you will find that the two shot that they used doesn't necessarily match the, the single that they use of you in terms of it being exactly the same choices or whatever. 
but you know, if you're providing them the raw material, you're doing your essential work in in weaving the story together. You're providing them notes like they're like you're like you're the keys on a piano, and you're providing them chords and notes for them to mix. And so, keeping that in mind, I knew that the camera would do most of the work for me. Um, so, you know, obviously, I made sure that I was off book and memorized and all that other stuff, but. I never in my life thought that I would book my Broadway debut from the comfort of my office. <laughs> bravo, bravo. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. so cool. That's cool. so cool. Yeah. Um, and thank you so much for the book recommendation. I actually first time hearing about it. So I'm definitely going to read it. <laughs> read it. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, like, there's, I'm like right on it. <laughs> there's another book too, since you're a conversationalist and you like a good conversation, there's another book called Conversations with Walter Murch, which is, which is even better. It's going to make you want to go back and watch Apocalypse Now again, or watch any of his movies that he's edited because there's a, the, the way he talks about it made me feel so loose as an actor. It meant, oh my God, I thought all this responsibility for this performance was on my shoulders, just like it is in the theater. And with film, it's just not the case. Everything is prepared for you when you get there. There's a bunch of work that's gone into it before you arrive. The pressure's on to get five or six takes, but that doesn't mean you have to be perfect every take. In fact, the impulse that I had to keep going in this one take of the first scene that I did for the collaboration is probably what got me the part. You know, my mistake that I made with the lines and the fact that I didn't drop the line and just kept going and just made something up to fill the, <sighs> fulfill the end of the scene is probably what got it for me. Wow. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Yep. Love that. Very important. I'm just wondering, like, maybe one or two of your favorite films and why. Oh, Gosh, that's a great question. I have my geek favorites, which are Star Wars and and quite possibly the new Dungeons and Dragons movie that's coming out. Um, but that's 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 not that's not the film films that I love. Um, I love uh, Paul Newman. Like I said, is a bit, was a big hero of mine. Um, I loved uh, Cool Hand Luke when I was a kid. Uh, it's basically the story of of Luke. Uh, who's a Paul Newman and he's a vet, I believe is his backstory. And he decides to cut all the heads off these parking meters in his town and they arrest him and they throw him in this uh, chain gang. Um, in the South and where all the prisoners are treated badly, but he doesn't let it get to him. And he's a, he's a, he's a sort of symbolic sort of Christ-like figure uh, in the way that it's written and in the way that he plays it, he plays this, plays it with such lightness. And then, alternates that with so much passion and there's just so much truth in his eyes and so much hurt in his heart that he just lets come through. Um, it's just a masterful performance, you know, it's something else. Mm. Um, so that's mm -hmm. one of my favorite mm -hmm. movies. Another favorite movie of mine. Oh, I love dramedies. I love Rachel getting married. If you've ever seen that movie, I love um, this, this year I loved uh, everything everywhere all at once. Um, I really enjoyed the nuance of a lot of the performances in the Fablemans. I thought, uh, is it Michelle Williams who was in that? Um, I didn't see it. I just, I yeah. saw it on the SAG Awards, but yeah. I haven't seen it. It's the story I, of Steven Spielberg, right? It's story his story of his childhood. family, him and his family and yeah. his childhood. Yeah. I, there was something that I really loved about that movie. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely in my top 10. A, a couple of Spielberg, I had the good fortune to work with him and his wife in a movie many years ago, but a couple of Spielberg movies are in, are in my top 10. E.T. is one of the best movies of all time. It's almost a flawless film, you know, and then I like my big epic films. You know, I like Lawrence of Arabia and a lot of classic Hollywood movies, you know, uh, uh, I like my bad movies. I love Godzilla movies, you know. <laughs> but if I if I could be in any kind of movie, I would I would want to be in a Star Wars movie, mm. you know, or TV show. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, switching gears. I mean, I I, mean, I think I could just go on for like four more hours. Or so yeah, um, I know. I feel the same way. You're great. Oh, you're, you're so sweet. So I mean, maybe you know, well, if you're open for it, maybe in the near future we can have you on and go more in depth, but would definitely like to touch upon, you know, your successful TV career that we mentioned um, mm. in the beginning of the episode, if you're cool with that. I'm cool with that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm proud of that. Okay. Career. Yeah. I mean, oh that's, that's what I spent the most time building in New York. You know, I, I did plays, uh, I, I could afford, unfortunately, you know, plays don't pay a lot of money and, um, you know, um, the cost of living is rising in New York. So I could afford to maybe do one play every 18 months from the time that I moved here until now. 
now. And that's about what I hewed to, you know, um, although I did take plays of ours to Steppenwolf and to um, CTG in LA, you know. Uh, so yeah, so I intended to, I came to New York intending to have a theater career, I ended up having a TV and film career. And then the second that I bopped out to LA to support that, I started getting auditions for all these plays again. So I ended up coming back. But TV wise, like I've worked with some really great people. I worked with uh, uh, Walter Hill, who directed The Warriors and uh, came up with the concept for Alien, the, the first Alien movie. Um, I've worked with um, I worked with Frank Oz, who is Fozzie Bear and Miss Piggy and Yoda, obviously, and just a great director. Um, there are all these sort of legendary people that I've had the opportunity to work with through television. Um, wonderful director named Seath Mann, uh, another guy named oh, Walter. I'm forgetting Walter's name. He directed one of the Walking Dead's that I was in. I've got a lot of Walters in my head. I've got an Uncle Walter too. Uh, it'll come to me. You know, uh, Sean Cassidy is a great showrunner, a writer, former uh, former um, a teen idol musician from the '70s. But now he's a he's a great showrunner and writer. I had, I've had the opportunity to work at his feet. You know, I I just you know. I've found that through television where a lot of people have a second career after they have a big movie or they have a big, you know, a big series or whatever, that there's a lot of real experienced people that I've spent a lot of time asking questions of. You know, I found myself as an actor going up to the cinematographer and saying, okay, what lens are we on? Okay. And why are we on that lens right now? Uh, okay, what, um, what's the, why are we moving the lights here? Like, can't we just keep the same light? He's like, no, because if we do that and we flop the camera around, it's going to look like the light's coming from a different place and it's going to be subconsciously weird on the film. I was like, oh, okay, okay, that's cool. Um, you know, so I was always asking people from makeup to hair to to the grips to uh, to the director what exactly they were doing and what their what their deal was. I've always found what other people do on set to be totally fascinating. So I think for most of my life I've been training for being a showrunner on a series, and um, that doesn't mean I'll quit acting or directing or whatever. A showrunner gets to do whatever they want to do, really. But now I'm working with um, as an actor I've worked with these guys, but now as a writer I'm working with them. I'm working with a guy named Tom Fontana who created the TV show Oz and Hom homicide and uh, city on a hill which is his most recent one and he's just a legendary writer who loves actors and uh, so i'm writing with him uh, barry levinson's gonna direct that one if we if we get uh, all the approvals we need to get i'm working with david simon who created the wire i'm writing with him right now i'm writing with ed burns uh, who separately on a different project had also created The Wire and Plot Against America and a bunch of other um, a bunch of other wonderful TV TV shows. He's an ex cop and an ex marine. He's a real tough boss. <laughs> but you know, uh, working working with all these guys and women, uh, Debs Patterson, who just directed some of the Willow series. You know, it's such a privilege to work because everybody that I get to work with really is at the top of their game. And I feel privileged to bring in my A game because they're bringing theirs. You know, my buddy Hank Steinberg, who was the showrunner on my show, I'm going to spend some time with him this week. And I learned more from just sitting across the dinner table from him during lunch and just listening to how he talked to his director of photography and his directors than I did, you know, from going to acting school, you know, just keeping my ears open. You know, and then so Walking Dead was a great experience. Uh, Mr. Robot was a great experience. Uh, you know, uh, working with, uh, for David Fincher on um, on uh, Mind Hunter was an incredible experience, unlike anything I've ever done in my life. It was like playing a piece of classical music. I just uh, consider all these wonderful, wonderful people to be my teachers. And um, and how is that you know, process when you did that audition? If we you want to talk about auditioning for David Fincher. I auditioned for David Fincher three or four times before I got that part. And I was like, okay, Mr. Fincher, are you going to bring me to the dance? Or are you going to just keep flirting with me? <laughs> like, what's what's going on here? And um, But really, he was waiting for the right part to come along that was effortless for me. And which doesn't mean to say that there's not effort on a David Fincher set. Everything is... I've never been more precise in terms of um, continuity. When I set down a pen, I set it, set it down in the exact right place at the exact right angle on the exact right line. When I give a variation on something, I give it within very tight parameters. This is not jazz working with David Fincher. It is a piece of classical music. It is akin to Shakespeare. You know, there is a technique involved. You know, I even had a, um, I even had some assistance from a, 
there was something that, that there was elastic that held my shirt down so the shirt collar wouldn't shift between takes. And I did, I don't know how many things, I think I did 12 takes from each angle, which is completely unusual. I usually do three or maybe four. If I don't get it on the first take, I'm, I, I, I'll get it by the third or fourth take. But I think it was expected by everybody that we would do 12 takes that day from this angle and 12. That's what they scheduled for. It was so mind blowing to be so still and to have them pick up so much. And to, I played a child psychiatrist in it and I played the part very seriously, but the way David filmed it um, and his crew filmed it, there was so much humor in it, which totally surprised me because I wasn't playing the joke. I was just playing the straightforward version of the scene that I felt in my body and in my head. Um, but you know, uh, everything is about stillness on a Fincher set. I hope I get to work with him again because mm-hmm. I would really like to work with him more long-term than just this, uh, this one little job. Yeah. And then w- where did you shoot it? I believe we shot uh mind hunter in Pittsburgh, uh, which is, which is where I went to school. That's where I went to Carnegie Mellon. Um, so it was a nice, a nice trip, full circle trip back home for me in a way. Um, but we shot, we shot almost all of that in Pittsburgh. I did two or three episodes, I think. And then how, for the actor listening, how was the audition process? Were, were you on the Zoom or were you in person? This was on was tape. That? My wife put me on tape for all of these. So uh, it was it was all on, it was constantly on tape. That People had started taping pre-pandemic uh, a little bit more from people's apartments and stuff like that. And we just lit it well and um, and taped it in front of our, our little blue curtain uh, that we have hung up over there. And it involved, I think, preparing for the Fincher audition. I knew that, I know that he's very specific about about getting all the words right and getting all the ands in the right place and using the semicolons and the commas. So I wasn't just memorizing lines. I was also memorizing the punctuation without putting too much oomph in the meaning. I still had to listen to my partner. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I had to keep... I, it felt like juggling a lot of clubs. You know, It wasn't juggling balls. This was juggling clubs because they're spinning in the air and they're going around at the same time. But you have to be perfectly still in your center in order for it to work. So I, I think the, the three auditions that I did for him that didn't that didn't work actually taught me a lot about finding what did. It um, was for different projects? No, it was all for Mindhunter. It was all for oh, Mindhunter. Yeah. Got it. So they uh, had you retape and retape and retape. Yeah, yeah. They had me they had me tape for three different for three different parts before I booked the fourth one. Yeah. Different yeah. roles. Different roles. Yeah, absolutely. Same, so your agent and is just like what what's the explanation from the agent? It, they love they want you. you to read for this one. They, they love oh, you. They, they love, they love you. you. They really they love-, love you and they want to have you they want to have you do something on this show, you know. You you must have gotten close in the last two or three, <laughs> you know. And then Fincher did have me in uh for an audition uh for a movie uh later on, um, which which means I'm still on his radar, which means, you know, we'll we'll end up working together someday. It just it just depends on what, you know. Um he's into different shit that I'm into. Like his obsessions, uh, you know, we didn't we didn't I think he I think he likes music as much as I do, but his obsessions differ very much from mine. But I think that's the reason that we work well together is there's so much to learn from each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's um, there's a lot of filmmakers that I vibe with because we have very similar interests. We like The Grateful Dead or we like, you know, uh, we like mixtapes or we like uh, particular movies or whatever, or particular directors or particular styles of filmmaking or we have the same kind of looseness. I'm very I can be very loose on set. I'm most comfortable when I'm when I'm super loose but with Fincher I had to be super disciplined and and a little bit tight and that was that was cool it was it was cool relaxing into that but you know he's just a, one of those unique geniuses that you just get a chance to work for and you want to do it again and again and again because you know yeah I think because of uh your director hat skills because mm. like obviously Meisner blue shirt blue shirt Meisner yeah it's forget all punctuation so I don't think Meisner is this technique at all but because of you being a director having that discipline with the punctuations um because you know they're they're different parts of the the brain, left brain, right brain, muscle memory, and so it's a it's a skill set to it is. to be able to harness. Mm-hmm. Rock and roll yeah. is different from jazz. Is different from classical music, which means your approach is different. It's all music, and we all enjoy it in various ways. But like even within rock and roll, you know, punk is very very different from R and B. Is very different from the blues, even though they use the same basic chords and oftentimes the same 
chord structures in their most basic forms, they're very different from each other. They're, it requires different technique. It requires a different touch. So why would you approach one director's work the same as another director's? You know, um, I think another good piece of advice for younger people out there who are working, there's no time. I know auditions come and they come quick and they come fast. And there's not a lot of time to do research and even memorize the lines because things move so fast these days. But if you get a chance to watch uh, a great movie by the person you're auditioning for. Don't copy the style of the movie, but you can see where their interests are. You know, you can see where they're super, whether they're super interested in the pause between lines or whether they like things quick. You know, uh, there's some directors who really revel in um, the moment after a scene is over. You know, um, uh, uh, there's some directors who really revel in the rhythm of language. Um, and really like his actors to be right on top of each other when they, when they work together. Um, you know, so my approach for every director now is different because I make sure to watch at least one thing that they've directed to sort of freshen me up before I go into an audition a couple of days later. Wow. That is such a beautiful layer. It's so important. I loved hearing that. It gave me a new, um, foundation of understanding um because i do that i i will if i have the time i'll watch a tone of a show if it's a tv show and if it's not available like uh, like the trailer or just clips on youtube or mm -hmm. or i'll watch a film to get like the vibe right of the director but to do what you just said the beats the pauses the moment after the scene ends mm -hmm. like the the rhythmic the language it's it's wow that's so Powerful. Thank you. That's yeah, smart. I'm friends with this guy, uh, Peter Hedges, who wrote, directed, I think The Squid and the Whale was his. I think um, something, is, Bill is back. Oh, his son is uh, is an actor as well. And they did a movie that came close to winning an Oscar a couple of years ago. He's just a beautiful storyteller, but it's all about the emotion between the lines for him. Um, it's all about the emotion exists after the person says the terrible thing or beautiful thing that they're going to say. Um, uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape was his. Um, mm. He wrote that, uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie. You know, there's some directors who like a lot of emotion and like very lush emotion in their stuff. And there's some directors who are a little cooler and like to hang back a little bit. You know, um, Quentin Tarantino likes things to be cool until they explode. Um, you know, I don't know if there's, I mean, I guess you could call parts of Pulp Fiction a love story <laughs> right up until the point where he stabs her in the heart with a hypodermic needle. But I mean, that's true love right there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. But, you know, he doesn't, Tarantino doesn't spend a lot of time in the bedroom. He doesn't spend a lot of time having actors like sort of fawn over each other with their eyes. He likes, he likes shoot 'em ups. He likes, uh, he likes, uh, ninja movies. He likes uh, samurai films. And so his stuff is, he likes Westerns. And so his stuff is filled with that kind of language, you know? So even if you can get somebody who's an influence on a director and watch their movie, that's sometimes even more valuable. Um, because you're saying, Oh, he's really into Sergio Leone, the, the Italian director, um, who, who did all the um, spaghetti westerns back in the day starring Clint Eastwood. Well, I mean, you look at that and you look at Django and there's like so much stuff that those uh, Leone films have in common with with uh, Tarantino movies because there is deep, big influence. He really loves that stuff. So you learn a lot from people's influences as well. So it's it's great. What's great, if you get in a conversation with a director, ask a director what their influences are and they'll go on forever. They'll feel like they just had the best conversation in their life because they get to talk about their favorite filmmakers. And, you know, Steven Spielberg doesn't want to sit around talking about E.T. all day, but I just saw an interview with him and he could talk about Lawrence of Arabia for hours and hours and hours on end. And like, and why? And why it's a beautiful movie and why it's such a difficult film and why it portrays humanity and sort of wide sweeping swaths of, of backdrop uh, amidst uh, these beautiful close-ups of, of Peter O'Toole with his deep blue eyes and giving his all, giving all of his heart to, uh, to this very empty man uh, that he's portraying. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. So if you ever want to really get on with a director, just simply ask them what their influences are and let them, let them go. They will Smart. walk away from you thinking you're the most interesting person in the world. Smart. That that's a great tip. Great tip. And speaking of Quentin Tarantino, uh, shout out to uh, Joanna Ray, uh -huh. because yeah, when I met her, uh, she cast me in the bad lieutenant. And when I met her, oh, right on. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, she for she at that point when I met her, 
she, you know, told me she uh, was in casting for 25 years and she cast all of his films. Uh huh. Right? right on. Sure. And and also I met. Um, you did that in New Orleans, right? Yeah. 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 yeah and yeah. then um, Jenny Jew, she's uh, she was there, too. She was her casting partner at the time. Not uh-huh. sure if they're still working together or not. But yeah, it was it was fantastic. Um, you know, to shout out to the lady casting directors. And it was just so amazing when when I met her. I just felt like legendary just to be in such great company. So yeah, totally. you, when you're. When you're in those moments, it's like really to acknowledge and appreciate them. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, casting directors. There should be an Oscar category for casting directors. There isn't. Um, I think that should change. They are your most stalwart allies. Um, if you can bring in good work, even on the ones you fail on, as long as you can bring in a choice or bring in some kind of work for them, that's a take on what they have. It might not be the best choice for the movie, but it might be really interesting for them. You know, I always try to bring a cast director who I, especially ones that I have a close relationship with, I always try to bring them in my best work and and feel a little sad when life gets to me and I'm not able to memorize as hard as I usually do. And when I'm not able to put in the hundred, because life happens, you know, uh, when I'm not able to put in, when I'm not able to put in the 100% for somebody, it, it really, it really bums me out. So I try to make extra time for those casting directors who have been my, my most loyal allies in this business. They're very important yeah. people. Yeah, love the casting directors. So since you touched on the subject, I mean, if it's okay, like, Mm -hmm. like, how is it for you, like you said, with mental wellness and, you know, giving it your all and and maybe not being able to be off book? Nowadays, I feel, let me know if I'm wrong, because you probably audition way more than me. But through my journey thus far, I feel they give less material than used to, like before they you get like, Five different scenes, 26 pages, 12 pages, two Sometimes. days ago. Yeah. Yeah. So how is it when you can't be off book? Like, what do you do? Well, I mean, it depends. Part of it is a volume problem for me, especially since finishing the collaboration. There's a lot of people now who, who fortunately want to hire me and, or at least, or at least want to audition me and who are at least considering it. And so like, if I get three auditions that have to be turned over in 72 hours and two of them are nine pages long of nine pages of sides, like three to four scenes. That's a lot of material to give an actor for them to be able to, to memorize. You know, I, I hope I'm not poking the bear by saying this, you know, um, sometimes memorized enough has to be enough. And there's things that I've booked that I, I was looking down at the page quite a bit during the audition and felt like, well, I was looking down at the page. They're not going to hire me, but they're seeing my interpretation. And they've seen actors on set hold the lines and get ready to do the scene or whatever. You know, usually for those situations where I've got 14 pages of sides to memorize and there's a lot of action and I got to hold up a gun and tell people up against the wall and there's a bunch of shit going on. Um, for those, I'll have the sides kind of at the ready and I'll, I'll try to go over the main beats of it and I'll let the emotion carry me. But, you know, for, for more specific things, I just had this interesting audition for something that takes place in West Virginia. It's a ghost story. And, um, it's uh, and it was playing this guy who's in charge. Uh, I can't go into too much more detail than that, but he's a he's a powerful guy in the community um, and definitely the the villain of the movie, but a nice guy villain. You know what I mean? And that was only four pages. So I was able to give it due diligence and memorize it. But, you know, on the flip side, this other audition that I got, great movie, super cool, great pedigree, a lot of awesome people in it. They sent me 14 pages of what it was effectively the same scene. And so they were all action scenes, which means they want to check that I can do action. But I could have actually given them a lot more if they'd sent me one action scene and a talkie scene. You know, if they'd sent me half the number of pages, I could have done I could have done twice the work for them, you know. And that's sometimes that's first time directors, you know, who really need to see what somebody can do. But, you know, sometimes it's people who haven't been around actors a lot. There's a lot of editors who become directors and maybe don't know that we're not memorizing machines. We're not machines. We're people, you know, but you know, it all depends. I, I try, I try to be cold off book for everything. And, Mm -hmm. um, uh, as long as I'm 75 to 80% there, I feel like that's a successful audition for me. But again, you know, I, 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 I think that because people are self taping, I think the powers that be feel like we have all the time in the world and, and we don't, you know, and so you, you've got to you've got to decide for yourself what your best. I always feel better. Like for example, for the collaboration, I was I I memorized that all 
before the first rehearsal. Now, of course, the play changed through rehearsal, so I had to memorize it again and again and again. But, you know, um, this movie that I'm doing with Sadie this summer, I'll be completely off book for the whole movie, so I don't have to think about it, you know, uh, by the time we by the time we start shooting. I don't want to spend the days memorizing my lines and directing and talking to the camera person and making sure that the location is solid. I can't. I can't do all those things at once. So the memorization is the one thing I have control over. And that's the last time an actor has control over the script is mm-hmm. the is the memorization mm-hmm. phase. So so I mean I have some mixed feelings about it, but I feel like as long as I'm 80% there, that's that's uh, respectful and um and isn't blowing people off. I tried in my early years, I tried like doing the the uh Spencer Tracy, I don't like to rehearse thing and just you know, read off the page in the room, but that wasn't really working. And I didn't under my, in my young, my young self didn't understand that Spencer Tracy was a genius. I wasn't a genius. So, (laughs) so having, having that approach wasn't the best for me. You know, I like to, I like to be fully off book before, uh, before I hit a project. And then lastly on this topic. So with the self tapes and I've gone in when I was in LA and even here in New York, when I went to a reader, just because I didn't want to deal with the editing, I didn't want to deal with the anxiety of all the other stuff. I just wanted to show up, act, leave, and just receive the link to send, right? Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to do it. But now these taping services, right? And sometimes I did some home auditions where I was with my mom and, you know, she would be like the DP recording Mm me. Mm -hmm. Sure. (laughs) Uh, Thanks, mom. And read it. Thanks, mom. And reading with me, but her voice sounds like uh, like a 14 year old. So it's like really particular. <laughs> She's so innocent and cute. So it's so particular of like what she can read with me. Right. But but she's great. But, you know, people are doing iPads. Right. And like not uh-huh. having paper in hand and yeah. and having iPads and literally like these taping services place offer and they charge extra money for it by the way oh. but um for you to read it off an ipad do you do anything off a ipad um a digital screen or do you always have the paper and even if you have it memorized do you hold the paper as well the i do hold paper um but um the only thing the, the thing that my attention should be most on is not an ipad in front of me or uh, or um or uh, uh, uh cue cards or anything like that the thing my attention should be on is my partner and you know if i'm reading be- human behavior and responding to human behavior it's much better than and i can as a director i can see when people's eyes are moving on an ipad like i can tell when they're reading the lines it's subtle, but I can see their eyes pop back and forth because I've spent so much time in, in, in an editing bay. And, you know, to be able to have that cool focus uh, that one needs to hold a moment on camera, I need to know that somebody can do that within themselves. You know what I mean? I don't want somebody showing up on set having to be fed their lines, you know, like, so if I see them doing, like I said, about 80% off book, and I can catch their eyes at the beginning of the scene and in the middle and the most important part, then at the end, then that's the real, that's the real, oh, they can really do this. They can really hold this together. You know, I understand people have lives and that, you know, but if somebody's, if somebody, if I'm on the fence about somebody about that, um, then we have a call back for them and we tell them to make sure that they're as off book as they possibly can be. And, 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 uh, but that's what I'm weirdly feeling now is like the lack of callbacks. Like, there aren't a lot of callbacks anymore. Like people just do it off the tape and and hire off the the first tape, which is kind of great, but also a little bit weird. And you know, um, I, I love yeah. callbacks. I love a chance to come back and give something a little extra flavor or do what the director needs me to do on it a little different. You know, it gives me a lot of confidence to have a callback. But that's kind of that's kind yeah. of gone away in terms of the the same way that in person auditions have gone away. Yeah. Um. My very first experience was uh, in two thousand and five. John Papsideras. And um, Wendy O'Brien, Wendy mm. O'Brien was working in uh, John Papsideras' office at the time. And um, I went out for It's Always Sunny and they booked me off the tape. I was in the room with Wendy O'Brien, mm. but then I didn't have a callback. They just booked me right off the tape. And that was in 2005. So I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I think that's pretty good. I, I, I loved doing Always Sunny. Did you do, did, I did an episode of that. Did you like doing it? Oh my god! Yeah, I was a uh, season one Charlie's prom date. Oh, that's cool. I was, I was, <laughs> I was a creepy guy who attended children's pageants. <laughs> so which season? Uh, which uh, I want to say season eight, 
but I, I, oh. I can't, I can't quite. I can't quite remember. All I remember was I was on set with some of the funniest people in the world and all of the comedy made me really uncomfortable. Um, Mm. Really good. I think really good comedians have that effect on people. You know, it made me really uncomfortable, you know, but I mean, I got to work with Danny DeVito, which was a dream come true. And, and um, with all those other, with all those other, other uh, people, which is, uh, which is a lot of fun, you know, Rob and Greg and Charlie day, everybody. Yeah. yeah. I was like, man, you guys all did this yourselves, you know, like what, what an yeah. incredible, what an incredible um, thing you guys have created together, you know, talk about community yeah. and ensemble. I mean, that's a great one. Oh yeah. 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 My brother, my brother keeps um saying, yeah, like contact the people. Like um he, I don't know if they're doing a comeback or reunion. He's like, get in there, like get in there. So you and me should tag team and like reach out to them and be like, write our characters back in. Yes, exactly. <laughs> my character gets out of prison and goes to prom. No, <laughs> it's terrible. Something. I just, I just, I just, for, for a while there in mid-career when my grandmother was still alive, I was playing a, just a series of bad men. And she finally called me one day after her friends watched a Law & Order in which I did something particularly egregious as the character. And she she said to me, why can't you play nice men? <laughs> I was like, I'm sorry, Grandma. I just have one of those faces. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, always sunny. Yeah, it was. Uh, I've I've only done a couple single camera comedies. Uh, I did that, and I did um, oh Tina Fey's show, uh, the uh, behind the scenes at NBC show. Oh, I can't remember the name of it. You know, it stars Tina Fey and uh, Alec Baldwin. Mm, I don't. I, it's not coming to my head it's right not, now. It's not coming to my head. I I played uh, <laughs> I played the uh, Transylvanian ambassador to the UN which was a lot of fun. So I got to do my Dracula voice. I am not a vampire. Yeah, no, it was really fun. It was really fun. Oh, yeah. uh, Yeah, I forgot the title of the show. I can't remember. You really need to pivot into more voiceovers every day with yeah. all your voices that you do. I really want to do. I had some. I had a great cartoon audition for Cartoon Network the other day uh, for this like sort of show about a court, and it was like all these funny like little English voices and British voices and voices of different types of royalty and their and their servants and stuff like that. And it was a hoot. It was so much fun. And I was making my wife laugh in the other room. She was having to like put her hand over her mouth because I was doing all these silly voices and it requires, you know, it requires such commitment and, and it's fun to do funny voices. It's fun to like make big giant cartoonish choices that you would never make on camera. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. I like exploring that. World. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Oh my God. This has been so wonderful. And I, I would love to invite you to come back on. I would love to on come back show. on. You know, I will. I'll come back after um after we've uh, after we've directed our movie with my daughter. I will come back and maybe I'll maybe Sadie will pop in and say hi, and we can we can ask her some questions about her first movie experience. Yeah, I would love that. that sound sounds like fun? really good. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, sounds like fun. I mean, there's just so much we could talk about because, like, I'm like, oh, I was on Law and Order too, like SVU. Yeah. <laughs> like, that was really cool. <laughs> Did you work with Mariska could, like, on SVU? Did you, did you, did you work um, with Mariska I, Hardity? I didn't. I worked with Ice-T. Oh yeah. He's great. The blonde lady. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Okay. I got you. I'm names today are just not sticking with me. Yeah. I, no, I mean, we're almost like two hours in right now. So like, <laughs> <laughs> our brains are like, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's but, time no. to, yeah. Maybe it's time to, time to wrap it up. But I, but I really have, it's just a, it's just a testament to your wonderful interviewing skills and, and your, uh, your interest in the world and your love of life. And I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's a real privilege. And, uh, I have a lot of gratitude for being here to talk with you. Mm, I receive it. It means a lot. Thank you so much. Cool. I really, really appreciate that. Thank yeah. You. And I know there's been, yeah. And I know there's been so much value for the person tuning in. I normally say share this with one person, but please go ahead and share this with like five to 10 different people. Everyone loves entertainment. Everyone loves theater, movies, TV shows. A lot of people want to be actors, had dreams of being an actor. And we just had an amazing guest on, Eric Jensen. Would love for you to re-listen to the episode Take notes when you pass on the episode, let them know in advance, take notes, because there's some really cool pointers to write down. 
Share it on social media. Make sure you're subscribing and liking. Definitely check out the show notes. Follow Eric. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh what? You want to mention oh. my podcast? Oh, oh, two things. Two yes. things. One, w- w- two things. One, we do giveaways every single episode. So it doesn't matter if you're listening to this episode today or four years from now. There's an email or the contact. Write in Eric Jensen for the subject and enter in the giveaway and maybe you can have a 15 minute call with Eric, maybe a a signed headshot. So, you know, anything could happen. Uh, We have a lot of uh, artists on the show. So we're always doing giveaways no matter what it is. So when you hear it, it's not too late. I like to include you. We're a part of the ripple effect. We're caring and sharing and and gifting and giving so much. So um, it's my pleasure to make sure that you win something. Yes. And then um, please, I'll put it in the show notes, but what's your podcast um i have a podcast with my friend phaedra al casey and it's the two of us talking about dungeons and dragons and storytelling um it's called bard quest empire it's on all of the podcast uh platforms and it's the two of us talking to some of the best storytellers of our time including the uh, the main showrunner of the walking dead universe uh uh people like joel marsh garland who starred in uh, orange is the new black you know just uh you know really really great storytellers from actors to directors to writers to video Video game designers and we talk about Dungeons and Dragons and the influence it's had on their storytelling overall and it's a it's a we, we the episodes are about 90 minutes each and they're it's a good listen on the subway this has been one of my favorite episodes thank Mine you so too. much I appreciate you <laughs> I yeah, appreciate you too been, Katie it's been a lot of fun I mean I could literally keep going but I'm just like want to be really mindful so copy that copy um, that I hear you okay make sure you're liking subscribing and sharing this with at least five to ten people we'll see you next time bye bye thank you so much for joining us we'll see you next time kiriaki over and out